So today we're going to be talking about a nice little journey that we're going to talk, we're going to walk you through. Um, it's something dear to my heart as we went through the, the movie series, right? At the movies. How many of you guys really enjoyed that series? Yes? At the movies? So let me tell you a little secret about myself. I am such a movie buff, man. I just, I get enthralled in movies. Anybody else like that? You are just caught up in movies all the time, yeah? See, my problem with movies <clears throat> is this. And, and my wife will laugh at me because I'll watch a movie, man, and I walk out of that movie, and I'll sit there and think, like, man, how do I, I think I could be Batman, right? I think I, I just got to train a little bit, and I think, right? But, but movies to me, man, they're a tease, right? They're this, they're this tease into adventure, right? Does anybody else ever feel that way? You watch a movie, it leads you on a journey. I don't know. Hey, if you're into chick flicks, you're into chick flicks. If you're into action, gladiator, brave heart, how to lose a guy in 10 days, right? Whatever it is for you, whatever that movie is for you, something about it like catches you, right? Something about it kind of steers you along, whatever that favorite movie is. And so for me, I was always a huge movie fan because they brought me somewhere. Like they took me on this adventure and my, my lazy tease out of it is I just get to watch this dude go on an adventure, right? I don't got to do any work for it or anything, but I'm caught up in their adventure, right? And so I remember when I was eight years old, eight years old, I'm sitting in church and the pastor starts off and goes through the teaching stuff. At the end of it, he does the altar call, right? Presents like this amazing life, right? Like this life, if you come to Jesus, this is going to be such an amazing thing for you. You're going to love him. So like, yeah, I'm in. So first thing he says, raise your hand if you come in. I'm like, well, hold up. We're not there yet, right? I'm not going to raise my hand. But then he led us through a prayer. And I remember I looked over at my dad and I said, dad, does that mean I'm saved now? He's like, yeah, absolutely. You're saved now. And I'm like, awesome, cool. So that's all it was. So now in my mind, I'm thinking like, so now I've got like this amazing life I'm going to live, right? So we go out, I get a little reward, a little banana split, right? Fantastic. This is the life for me. And then I'm, I'm expecting this kind of roll out of this new epic adventure. And, and you know what I got? Not that, right? You know what I got? It was like so many rules. Oh, I forgot to warn you guys. This is Splash Zone. I spit when I talk. I'm so sorry. It's going to happen. I just saw one. I had grabbed in two services in a row, so I'm sorry about that. But check it out. You know what I got from it was just a bunch of rules, right? Like, like I'm walking along. And I'm, I'm expecting like doors to open. Like, wow, check it out. You're going to be doing this, Sean. You're going to see this. You're going to see that. I'm like, yeah, dude, sign me up. Here we go. And then it says like, oh, by the way, that door closed, that door closed, that door closed. This is all you can do. So I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought this was going to be like an adventure, not like a bunch of rules and stipulations of things you can and can't do. Man, it was so bad. I remember I showed up to church and I walk in, I'm telling people, I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. And what do I get? Don't you speak that over yourself. You can't say that. And I'm like, I can't even tell you the truth. I can't even tell you I'm not feeling good, right? So this was like the Christian life as it turned out to be for me, this lifestyle that I signed up for and, and I feel like I was duped, right? And so life goes on, it continues on, and, and my brother and I, I was 15 at the time, and they were in this youth group, and we'd just been going, just kind of living out, and uh, they present this, this mission trip to Bolivia, right? So my brother and I are talking about it, Parents gave the okay, and we're like, yeah, I'll go on the mission trip to Bolivia. And if I can be honest, it was because it sounded cool. That's it, right? It sounded like a good time, man. I'd love to go to Bolivia. They showed, like, these little commercials of people, like, jet skiing in the ocean and, like, this, this cool stuff. So I'm like, yeah, dude, sign me up. Let's go, right? So we get there, and this is, like, the opposite dupe that I got. We get there, and we're sitting there, and then they start, the, the preacher does something. He goes, okay, so here's what to expect. You're going to have deaf people asking for prayer to hear. You're going to have blind people coming up to you asking to see. You're going to have people with massive tumors on their face because they used to chew cocaine leaves to numb their hunger. They're starving. So it's easier for them to get a drug and just chew it up than it is for them to get food. So <laughs> I'm sitting here like, hold up, hold up. I signed up for jet skis, right? <laughs> so I'm here, jet skis. I didn't sign on for this. And it was in that moment that I sat there and I thought to myself, man, I can't do this, right? I, I can't, right? A deaf guy is going to come up to me. He's going to be like, I'm going to be like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know what to do, right? Blind person is going to come to find me, and I'm just going to be like, hey, somebody come over here because 
I don't know the cure yet for this, right? So it was in that moment we're sitting there, they, they basically explained to us that, man, you have got to find God. Like, no more of the nonchalant, no more of the fake, no more of the phony. Like, you have got to find God, and you have to rely on God. And from that moment on, I'll tell you what's funny about it. I never, have, I never had spoken in front of a group. On that mission trip, two days later, I'm like doing an altar call in front of like 500 people. But it was that moment when I relied on God that God gave me like this whole other life. It, it was no longer was I in this church or following these rules and stipulations, man. I was caught up. I was in a journey. I was in an adventure. And God was just doing stuff that I just did not expect. And so how many of us here would love to be caught up in an adventure? Amen? I mean, show me your hand. Let's be real, right? Let's get caught up in an adventure. So today we're going to walk through. And we're going to take you guys on the journey of, of one is going to be the civilian life, what you know. The other, it's going to be the life you want. Amen? Amen. So the first person I always like to bring up, man, the guy who I know in the Bible that just flat out lived. Like this dude had life. This dude lived life. This dude was crazy. And his name, you guys may have heard of him, kind of a big deal. His name's Paul. Right? You guys heard of Paul? Yeah? Okay, cool. So we're going to go into 2 Timothy, and we're going to go into uh, Paul's writing here. Uh, and he, <laughs> this is when you know a guy has lived, right? So Paul is writing this the second time he went to prison. Not one time, the second time this dude went to prison for his faith, right? So he's in prison for his faith. He knows his time's coming. This is what he says. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. Can I just have you guys sit on that for a second? I want you guys to, to do your best to kind of role play here that this is you. Your life is coming to, and you don't know, but you just know it's close, right? You got a week, two weeks to live, and so you're writing kind of, you know it's your final letter to the person you love so much and you want to leave some final words with them, right? So I want you guys to kind of be in this moment, think of the words that you would say, okay? And this is what Paul has to say in his final moments. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. Man, you know what I love about that? Doesn't it almost seem like cocky, right? We don't look like, man, dude, come on, bro. Like, that's what you're going to throw out there? No, this dude knew. Like, he knew he lived a life for God. And he could sit there and write this with confidence saying, guess what, man? My journey's up. My time has come. It's over. I have so much awaiting for me because when I lived here on earth, I gave it all. I poured it all out. I gave every bit of my being. And that's what we're going to talk about. Man, how do you get there? Right? Because if we're honest with ourselves, what are we going to say? Oh, man, I wish. Right? Oh, man, I hope everybody's going to be okay when I leave. Or I wish I had done more. I wish I had focused on this and not this. I wish I had more time. All these wishes and hopes. Can I be honest with you guys? If that's what you think in your last words would be, you have not lived for eternity. You have not lived for that. You are living here. Okay, so he goes on to say, um, he says, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So again, man, Paul was a man with confidence at the end of his days that he could just look back and say, man, I did it. I lived. I'm good. So now I need to leave you with some parting words. Okay, so now this is Paul writing and saying, Timothy, these are things you need to know before I go, because I know I'm going, this is what you need to know. Okay, so the next scripture we're going to dive into, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. So again, Paul is writing Timothy, he's saying, this is a priority, this is what you need to know. And he tells him this, he says, endure suffering. What? (laughs) What? Endure suffering? Ah, man, right? So it's like, (laughs) yay, all right, cool, that sounds fun, thanks Paul, good talk. He says, endure suffering along with me as a what? As a good soldier. What do you think it means to be a good soldier? Right? He's not saying, um, endure suffering along with me as a spectator. You can just watch, enjoy, have a good time. right? You can, or endure suffering along with me as a civilian, as just normal, as just mundane, right? No, a soldier has like a calling to it, doesn't it? So if he's saying that to Timothy, don't you think he's saying it to us? This is words Paul is writing to Timothy, but it sinks in so well with us because guess what, guys? You're a soldier and you're behind enemy lines. That's the truth. 
And if you don't understand that, this teaching is not going to make sense to you. He goes on to say, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. Man, guys, this, they, they just, just this, this noise, this life that we live, that's the civilian life. For then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Guys, civilian life, you know what that feels like? Or Boring. It's mundane. It's just stuff is happening, and you don't know why it's happening. Just, you're just living life. If you can be honest with yourself, guys, look at your life and say, I mean, are you just living a pattern? Are you just waking up day to day? Man, hey, tomorrow's going to be tomorrow. Today is today, and guess what yesterday was? It was yesterday. Just stuff is happening. I'm just along for the ride, right? If you're saying that is your life right now, guess what life you're living? It's a civilian life. But if you're telling yourself, man, I want more. I want adventure. I want to live a life of passion, a life of love, a life that goes beyond this, then we need to live life as a good soldier. Amen? So all y'all are saying, yeah, hey, I'm ready for adventure. Well, hey, first thing we got to do is look at the traps of the civilian life that's going to do its best to hold you down. So you guys ready for that? All right, so let's take a look at the civilian life. So the first thing, if you're a civilian, if you're here just living life, the first thing you need to make sure, be busy, right? You just got to be busy. I mean, man, we celebrate if you're busy. And you know what's funny about this trap of the civilian life? You know what's funny about it? Is it's all caught up in making you feel important, right? I mean, if you're busy, that means you're a somebody, right? Like, hey, man, can you come over? I got to check my calendar, bro. Let me see. You know that calendar's blank, too. I'll pencil you in, right? What time are you thinking, you know? Well, you tell me. No, just please tell me. Tell me. It's all, no, no. But we're busy, right? And we get our caught, ourselves just caught up in just doing stuff. And I ask you guys, I mean, how many of us would admit to saying, man, I'm busy. I just do stuff. But how many of you guys would look at the end of the day after just a busy day and say, what did I do? Right? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, today just kind of happened. Man, I was busy. I was stressed out. I got anxiety, all this stuff happening. But at the end of the day, like, nothing. I accomplished nothing. I just lived another day that stressed me out, that wore me down, that tore me up. Guys, that's just being busy for the sake of this civilian life. You're losing it, right? The other thing about this trap is it's, I always say, man, this is like the sneakiest trap that you're going to fall into. And the reason why is because most of us, I'm going to be real, most of us are fighters, right? Like most of us have seen stuff, most of us has done stuff, and most of us are ready to fight back because someone's going to take what's ours, right? Right? So if I come to you guys and I walk up to you and I say, hey, just so you know, I'm here to make sure that you accomplish nothing for Christ. That's why I'm here. What are you guys going to do? Better do something, right? You're not just going to be like, yeah, okay, you got me. Yeah, man, this sucks, right? No, you're going to do something. But what's funny about this trap is it's doing exactly that, but then it makes you feel like you've accomplished something, but you haven't. You just did, right? So it just, it, look at what Scripture says about it. In Mark 4, 18, 19, it says, The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by first the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and desire for other things. So man, you heard it. You got it. You accepted Jesus, right? You, I mean, you're, you're getting it, right? But then just kind of life happened, and it sucked it out. And this last line is exactly what's going to happen to you guys. No fruit is produced. If you're just busy, and God wants to step in, and God is saying, I need you here at this time, your response is going to be, I'm booked. If you are too busy for God to move in your life, then you are caught right in the middle of this trap. Trap number two. First one is being busy. Got to make sure we avoid that in the civilian life. Step two, be peer approved. Man, this is a big one. How many of y'all admit to being people pleasers? Yeah, some people pleasers. I'm a people pleaser. I mean, I was like that from like I was five. Please don't be mad at me, right? Just love me. I just want to make you happy, right? I'm getting some faces of people who are like, 
Man, I ain't a people pleaser. I don't care about people. Can I tell you the same trap for a people pleaser is a people hater? It's a lose-lose, okay? <laughs> so don't think like you're big time like, oh, no, man, I don't care about people, so I don't got to worry about that. No, no, no. But this trap here is a people pleaser. And, and not to get too caught up in politically correctness, right? But it's like to live this civilian life, you can't upset anybody. You have to do anything anybody asks of you because you have to make other people happy. That's why you live. That's why you do, right? So I, if somebody asks me for a favor, I got to do it because I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to make them sad. I don't want to make them angry. And so for me, I was like, I, man, I was a huge people pleaser. I remember I read a book by a guy, John Eldridge, my favorite author. And he said a line that's always stuck with me. And he said, if you felt like you had nothing to prove, would you do it? And I say that for you guys, whenever you guys are looking at somebody asking you a favor or something, if you felt like you didn't have to prove yourself to that person, would you still do it? That's going to be a big way to kind of get yourself out of the people trap. So we're going to go to Galatians 1.10. And this is what Paul says about the peer approved. He says, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. For if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Guys, the reason why that's such a trap is because you could get caught up again in that being busy. You're just doing things for people, just doing, 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 because you want to make that person happy. But can I tell you guys, you may have accomplished nothing in the end. You have to make sure that you're not just doing this stuff to please people, because it says right there, if pleasing people is my goal, I'm not Christ's servant. If pleasing people is your goal, you have to understand that you're not Christ's servant. That's a big deal, Right? And let me show you, sometimes it's going to make sense. You think it's the Christian thing to do to please that person, to be a people pleaser, to make people approve of you. You're going to think that's the right thing to do. Let me show you in Scripture a time where we would all do the same thing, but that person was not listening to God, and that's Peter. You guys familiar with Peter, right? Another guy that, that people know him, right? So Peter is walking with Jesus, got the 12 disciples, and Jesus, as he's walking along, he says, hey, guys, who am I? Who do the people say I am? I mean, who, who am I to you guys? And it's a, one of the greatest moments for Peter's life because he gets a revelation of God, and he says, you are the Messiah. And we can look now, some of us who, who have been a Christian a long time or studied the Word, we can look and say, I mean, obviously. But no, in that time, man, that was huge for Peter to get that revelation. And you know what Jesus says? He says, Peter, you nailed it, man. You are the rock. Like, you got it dead on. That was straight from God. I mean, Peter has got to be on cloud nine, right? He's looking at the other 12 disciples. Those dudes are competitive, and Peter's like, ha, 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 yeah, 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 got it, right? Jesus is saying that I'm the rock he's going to build a church. I got it dead on. And then Jesus goes on to say, he says, good job, Peter, but check it out, guys. I'm going to die soon. I'm going to be turned over to my enemies, and I'm going to suffer. Peter follows it up with, no right? We would all say that, right? The person you love, the person you follow, the person that you have just said is the chosen one. This guy is the son of, like, he's the son of God. He's everything. And he says, guess what? I'm going to die. I'm going to get turned over to my enemies. So what does Peter say? No. I mean, just like I nailed this one. No, I'm not going to let you die. This, I'm going to support you. I'm going to make sure you're okay. I'm going to make sure you're happy. I'm going to make sure you're safe. Right? That's my job. And what does Jesus say? Get away from me, Satan. What? Talk about a hundred to just zero, right? Like you went from the rock you could have built the church to Satan, <laughs> right? Like what happened in a matter of like three minutes, right? And so he says, you are a dangerous trap to me. Hear that. That's not just coming from anybody. That's coming from Jesus. You are a dangerous trap to me. What that's saying, guys, Peter did what naturally all of us would do. Peter did what naturally we all do for each other. We want to support you. We want to help you. I want to make you happy because making you happy means that you're happy. This is what I want to do. But guess what? You can be a dangerous trap to others. You could be an enabler. You could be preventing somebody from getting a revelation of God because all you're doing is just continuing to do and do for this person when they need to learn to do for themselves. They need to learn to rely on God, and instead you're just doing because that makes sense to you. It's right for you to want to do these things, so you have to understand that just doing, just making other people happy, being peer-approved 
is a trap of civilian life. Another trap as we're going. So we got one, you're being busy, right? Two, you're living for the peers. You're living for everybody else around you. And three, guys, it's a trap that we all naturally fall into. Can I tell you what it is? Be safe and comfortable. Be safe and comfortable. Guys, if we can't get that this is a trap and not the mission of our life, you're not going to find adventure. This is the trap of mundane existence. This is just being the hamster in the wheel, just going and going and going and going and going, right? The reason why is because literally, guys, this is unattainable. It's unattainable. You are never going to finally hit the life where you're saying, I am as safe and comfortable as I want to be. I nailed it. I finally got there. You're going to move to your gated community. You're going to wall up all your windows in case a zombie apocalypse happens, right? There's no way they're getting in there. We are going to be as safe as safe can be. But guys, you are never going to be safe by just doing more, earning more, working harder. Because you can't prevent all that stuff. There's so many things that come to take from you. And we go into Matthew 6, 19, 21. It says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. But rather, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Because wherever your treasure is, what are you going to find there? Your heart. Your heart's desires. And I say that to get this through to you guys. If you are living to make your family more safe and comfortable, where do you think your treasure is? It's right here. You're living for here. And I got caught up in this trap so hard. I, I was working 14-hour days, and I'm just moving, and I'm just hustling, and what I think I'm doing, man, I'm just providing for my family. I'm making my family safe. I'm getting more and more money so they can be more and more comfortable, and I'm pushing forward, and I'm skipping church, and I'm not even paying attention. I'm just living forward, and then I got hit. Bam! Eternal moment in my life. I got hit by a moment. It made me realize you can't prevent everything. You cannot make people safe and comfortable all the time. For us in our lives, we had a child born. Everything seemed bright, right? We go through the whole nine months. Everything seems safe. Everything seemed good. We're doing all the checkups. She's born with a, with a defect that cost her her life. And can I tell you, 14-hour days couldn't have prevented that, right? 14-hour days isn't going to do anything about that. Me just doing and living in the mundane and doing all this stuff, there are things, guys, that we just can't prevent. But if I'm living my life to make sure that they will find eternity, I'm doing it right. If I'm living my life so that my treasures, my family, the people I love around me, if I'm working everything in my existence is to make sure that they make it to heaven, that's where my treasure is now, right? You can't just live to make this life more comfortable. And you can't just do that to your family because, again, guys, that's enabling them. They need to find God, amen? Your family, those people you love, I would trade all the comforts. I would trade all the safety of this earth to make sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they could say what Paul said. Amen? Amen. Could you guys imagine those people that you love so much, they can look and say, hey, I could say what Paul said. I live the life, right? So we have to avoid the trap of safe and comfortable, store our treasures in heaven, live for that, and that's where we're going to go into being a good soldier. Amen? So let's look at what it means to be a good soldier, right? We got all these traps that are catching us up in the civilian life. But to be a good soldier, can I tell you guys the first thing you need to do? you got to seek God's approval. Like, that's who we live for. That's why we're here. If I'm living my life to be approved by you guys, man, that's going to be a never-ending trap. But if I live and my love and my passion and my everything is given to God, everything else is going to fall into place. Amen? Live with one on your mind, not a hundred right? Live to please one. It's going to make it so much easier. So we're looking at 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, work hard 
so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Man, guys, can I tell you, at the end of your life, when you're sitting on deathbed, man, I, I can have people come up to me and say, man, you did good. Cool, that's cool. But at the end of your life, if you get to heaven and God can look at you, crown of righteousness and said, you did good. Amen? Right? You live for his approval. When you're living for that eternal approval, that is where you find life. When you live for his approval and you're no longer worried about all this, guess what's going to start falling into place? Not going to be as busy because I'm not living for all you guys, man. I'm living for God. God loves me and I love him. And that's where my heart lies. That's where I am. Amen? So one, man, we seek God's approval in all that we do, right? That's what we're going to do as a good soldier. He's our general, right? Our call to arms. That's the guy we're taking orders from, right? So our general usually gave us some orders, but is he going to send us out there unequipped? No, right? Of course not, right? So the next thing we need to make sure that we have is our spiritual gifts. Guys, if you're going to live for eternity, you need to use your spiritual gifts. Like we said, I mean, you guys all act like you confirm that. Yeah, no, I know I'm living behind enemy lines, right? You guys are saying you know that, but then you guys walk around just unequipped, just kind of like, oh man, <laughs> hope nobody wants to hurt me. Guys, you're a soldier. If, if, if this is you and you're saying, I'm a soldier, but I, have, I don't even know my spiritual gifts. Guys, we have, a, we have a step class that is for you. If you don't know your spiritual gift and you're saying, I, I'm ready to commit or I have committed, but I've never understood what my gifts are, guys, get to those step one, step two, step three classes. So step one happened today. Next week is step two. The week after that is step three. Step three is going to lead you through your spiritual gift and discovering what that is. Because guys, if you are not using it, you are walking around a soldier in enemy territory unarmed with nothing to bring. Can I tell you that's dangerous? It's a bad idea, right? So let's look at 2 Timothy 1.6 and look at what Paul tells Timothy about his spiritual gifts. So he says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. You know what fan into flame is? It means like, don't let it die out. You have to keep bringing it back, right? Getting air on the fire and making it bigger and bigger and fanning the flame and use it and use it and use it. Because I'll tell you this, guys, if, if you just are sitting on it and the one time you're called to use it, you're going to be that guy like in the movies trying to get a sword and it's like falling all over the place, right? You don't know what to do, right? You have to use your spiritual gift constantly. You have to live in it and use it. 1 Peter 4, 10, 11 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So here it is. You got the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. You have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Do you have the gift of hospitality? Open your home. Bring people in. Right? Whatever your gift is, whatever, trust me, guys, God's not going to, if you are just not a speaker, God's not going to be like, hey, <laughs> you know what would be funny? <laughs> right? No, that's not God, right? You know what God does with his spiritual gifts? And it amazes me, and I love it. You may not even know, but God will give you the spiritual gift that makes you come alive. You will find that that is just, it is what gives you your adventure. It is the passion you have within you. It is just, it makes you feel like it's not work anymore. I'm using this gift, and it is just, giving you the energy, the passion, and you're just excited to move into it. That's your spiritual gift. So don't think like, man, I don't know if I want to discover it because what if it sucks, right? Or what if I don't like it? No, 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 no. Your spiritual gift was tailored for you, and it will make you come alive. It's where you will find your adventure. So if you're using your spiritual gifts, you know what's great about that? Now whenever you start helping others, when you start moving out, I mean, we're not saying to forget people. But when you use your spiritual gifts, you're going to start taking them to a different place. And it's going to lead us to our next point. Fighting the good fight. If you want to be a soldier, you got to do what? You're going to fight, right? And so this is where we get caught up, right? In my early Christian life, you know what my fight was? Like, don't look at pretty girls. Don't say that cuss word. Right? And so every day I'm just like, oh man, oh man. Right? Somebody makes me mad, I just 
Ooh, and I run away, right? This is what I thought. I'm, 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 this is the, the fight for me. That's what's, guess what, guys? You always lose that fight, right? You always lose the fight of morality. But you know what fight is going to make you come alive? You know what fight Paul is talking about? The fight for other souls. Paul fought this so hard. Check this out. Paul walked into a town. And he said, I'm going to fight for this town. I want to win this town over for God. Right? And he walks into that town. You know what that town does? They say, Paul, you're wrong. They grab big stones and they pummel them with it. Dude gets stoned when he goes into the place. I got some heads popping up. Stone was like when they throw the stones, right? <laughs> the stones, they throw stones at him. This dude's like a bloody pulp, if you could imagine. Like, that's no fun, right? So imagine us. So then what do you think they do? They take him, right? And they just drag this dude out and they throw him out, on the, uh, out of the town. Get out of here. What are you guys going to do if that happened to you? Peace, right? I'm out of there. I'm not getting hit by more rocks. No, you know what Paul does? Sorry about this, man. You know what Paul does? Let's try again. Can you imagine? That is a man that's fighting the good fight. That's, a, that, that's what we need to be doing. Guys, if your fight is only just with your self-morality, you're going to lose it. But if your fight is for others' salvation, that's your adventure. When your fight is for other people's healing, or if your fight is for other people's eternal moments, that's your adventure. That's when you can only rely on God. I cannot bring salvation to anybody. I can't. But if I'm relying on God to walk me through and help me fight this fight, can I tell you, that is adventure. That is living. And that's where we need to be. 2 Timothy 4, 7 Paul's at the end of life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And what a thing we could say at the end of our lives. Amen? Wouldn't that just be an epic moment to walk away and say, man, I fought. Hey, when you fight, you're going to get bloody and bruised a little bit. Amen? He fought the good fight, and at the end of it, he could look at it and say, I remained faithful. I nailed it. So we need to fight the good fight. We need to use our spiritual gifts. We need to make sure that we're living for eternity and for God and God alone. But can I tell you something? If you're not going to do this next step, it's all for naught. So the next point is, guys, we need to offer our life to God. Offer it to God. This is a point to say that when you offer somebody your life, you can't hold anything back. So some of you guys may have accepted Jesus so long ago, so long ago, but you just, you never got caught up in anything. You were never part of an adventure. Check yourself. Did I hold something back? Paul says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. His life, everything about it, taken. I mean, imagine it, just the metaphor here. It's just poured out. It's all there. There is nothing I am holding back. And so many of us want to try this number where we get it and we just kind of right, just kind of tip a little bit out, but we still want to hold on to some of our things. God, I mean, God, you can have everything, but man, just... Finances are off limits. God, you can have everything, but I don't, I don't pray for people, right? God, you can have everything, but I want whatever it is for myself, right? And what's going to happen, guys, is God's going to take you on a journey. He's taking you on an adventure, and you're going, and you're seeking it, and you're going to run right into that moment. And if you didn't offer everything to God, you're going to turn around, hands up, and give up. Luke 9.23 says, and he was saying to them all, this is Jesus saying this. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. When? Daily. This is where we have to realize that this is not a one-time decision. Right? When you guys decide to say that I am going to offer it all to God and give it up, 
Does that mean the civilian life is just going to be like, ah, he passed. He's good. No, right? It's going to come after you. You're going to get caught up in busyness again. You're going to get caught up in peer approval. Every single day, Jesus says you need to walk, wake up, pick up that cross, and decide to serve him one more day. One more day. Your life is not going to be summed up by one decision. Your life is summed up by the thousands of decisions you make every single day to say, today is the day I pick up my cross again, and I follow him. I live for him. I've offered it all before him. Every head bow and eye closed.